and we are live with another episode of Geospatial Distancing. I'm Abby Lehman with L3 Harris Geospatial and I am your unrefined host. This is our fifth episode of Unscripted Repartee about all things geospatial and remote sensing. Every Thursday we bring you new panelists and topics for delightfully brainy and informal conversations. To add some levity hopefully to your current working at home situation or at the very least because it seems like every day is the same now, this serves as your weekly reality check that today is in fact Thursday. So we have an awesome panel today. Uh, it's featuring, I know I say this every week, but featuring two of my favorite people, uh, Joey Griebel, who's one of my L3 Harris colleagues, and Amanda O'Connor, who was part of our very first episode. She's making a return appearance. So I'll start with Joey, uh, a little background on him. He's been supporting NB customers for about 10 years. And right now, he's the king of multitasking because he's sharing an office space with twin three-year-old girls, which is madness. Um, <laughs> he, let's see, he's an off-roader and a mountain explorer. And more importantly, he's always been game for the hijinks that marketing pitches him. <laughs> Say hello, Joe. Say hello, Joe. Good morning. Joey. Good afternoon. Hello. So our second panelist, as I mentioned, uh, Amanda O'Connor, she just couldn't get enough of geospatial distancing the first time around. I'll introduce her as the geospatial phenom and <laughs> NVIDL OG, Ms. Amanda Condor. For those that missed her- Thank you, Abby. <laughs> hang on, hang on. For those that missed her first episode, I'll give you a quick rundown. She's CU Boulder alumni with a ferocious obsession for hyperspectral data, compute power, and data fusion. And in her second appearance, I'd say she is still most likely to have a cat show up behind her on the screen. The door is actually shut because they've been climbing on me. Nice. And it just didn't think it would work. <laughs> <laughs> so say hello, Amanda. Hi, everybody. Now, before we descend into the nitty gritty, I want to introduce my co-host. She's the blonde, popular, smart girl that you've always wanted to be your friend. <laughs> is Matria Grazing. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> Matri is here to monitor the questions you submit during the show and direct them to our panel. So remember that you can submit your questions and we encourage you to do so at any time using the Q&A button that you'll see right along the bottom of your toolbar. So we're going to start with something that many people, I guess, depending on where you live, may have noticed while working from home. Animals, wildlife, they're starting to show up in some really strange places since we've been in our hidey holes for shelter in place. Um, and apparently it can be seen in geospatial imagery. So actually first, sidebar, fun fact, Joey is an avid outdoorsman, which means he has a unique perspective on what this means for migration patterns and hunting season. Um, another fun fact, Amanda's home is situated right in the Boulder foothills. So that gives her a ringside seat to witness this whole phenomenon firsthand. So Amanda, I'm going to start with you. What's up with these crazy animals in your neighborhood? Well, um, thank you, Abby. Um, you know, being in the foothills for the last 14 years, you kind of get really in tune with the seasons. Like, you know, when spring is rolling in, when winter's coming in, and you know, when you can finally put tomatoes in the ground without like cursing yourself the next day. Um, and you know, one of the things that I've been noticing just in, you know, some of our walkabouts that we've done nearby to our neighbors, uh, our neighborhood, um, a couple weeks ago, we were walking around and um, in the mountains and we saw a ri river otter. I mean, I've never seen a river otter in my 20 years in Colorado. Um, and I was like, gosh, that's weird. And then, um, you know, we have a view into town because we're high, high above it. And it's like, you could usually see Denver International Airport on a good day. But usually there was the brown cloud. Like right now, you can actually like count the terminals. I mean, it's so clear. It's, it's absolutely insane. Um, so what I wanted to do was um, look uh, at some imagery to see kind of what we could see. Uh, whether there was any really remarkable changes um, that were coming around. And in the end, I would say the differences between the images that I saw, and I could show you some of the, the pics um, here. I think a lot of it was more water driven because 2019 was a very dry year. And it's hard to say like, well, this is the corridor that this animal's in. But what I wanna show you is just kind of some of the weird stuff that we have been seeing. 
Uh, we're good? Okay. Yeah, so we got three mountain lions, like, owning the world in Boulder, which is a little frightening, <laughs> um, considering this is, like, if you know the areas, which some, there's tons of geospatial scientists in Boulder, this is, like, two blocks from Ideal Market, if you know it. Um, here is actually a river otter. This kind of the brown spot in the rightish part of the scene is actually an otter in Boulder Creek. Uh, so this is down in the lowlands, not even up in the mountains uh, where we had seen them. Um, I, again, I've never seen my whole time here. They're extremely rare. Um, but I think without so many people perhaps um, navigating through the Boulder Creek system, um, they're feeling more comfortable to come out of, as Abby so well put it, their, their little hidey holes. Here's some moose uh, trying to get liquor. And um, this is Netherland, which moose are fairly common, but um, I love this picture just because it kind of shows you what, what's going on. Um, but who they're knew? coming. Amanda, who knew? <laughs> they're, drunk. they're total drunks. I knew it. <laughs> they're, um, they're coming down lower into my neighborhood. So like below 8,000 feet. Um, and pretty much, again, it went from never really seeing them around our neighborhood to almost every time we drive up to Netherlands, the back route, um, we we see moose, we see several moose, um, you know, we've seen calves. I mean, it's it just kind of blows our mind. This is actually around Christmas time. Um, again, I like the picture because of the background, but um, there's definitely there's pictures almost every day. And then this is what I was saying, um, kind of the view down into Boulder. So I'm up at about 6,500 feet and out on the horizon, you can see a couple of long white buildings and that is Denver International Airport. And for those of you who know the Denver metro area, you would typically see the famed brown cloud. Um, the brown cloud being air pollution that just kind of uh, gets caught in an inversion and um, hangs around the city. And so usually you would, you would definitely see a different hue to the sky, but I've never seen it that clear before. I mean, it's just, that killed me when I saw that. That's frightening given that uh, I, I would not consider Boulder to be a highly polluted area necessarily. And it's, it's not, I mean, it's just kind of the whole front range um, between, you know, you have a lot of people driving cars. It's not, you know, Denver's doing better with um, public transportation, but there's still a lot of commuting that happens in this area. And you also have to consider the agriculture. I mean, this is a dusty area, really. Uh, most of the farming that occurs here is dry land until you get closer to Kansas. So there is gonna be a certain amount of just, you know, soil and dust that's just gonna be in the air from here. Um, but I think with the combination of, you know, less people driving and probably a little less, um, maybe we're still a little bit early in the planning season, which is kind of a combination of luck to see that. And so this is actually some Sentinel imagery. And I, I had, I was telling Abby, I had some frustrations with Sentinel um, Hub trying to, because I thought I found some perfect images and then what I was downloading was different. So I gotta, I have to look into that. But you can see here, I plotted where these creatures were spotted in the Boulder metro area um, to give you an idea of, um, you know, kind of urban wildland is really making a comeback. Um, and that's, that's an interesting thought from a standpoint if you're a nature lover, but it's also, um, you know, a thought of, well, when we go back to our normal driving habits and, you know, living habits, you know, does this change? Does, or do they reestablish a colony? I mean, when I did the first um, distancing program, we talked a lot about now's the time to start studying the beginning of change um, to get your before images, to try to collect good data at this point, because we, we have an opportunity to have some control. We know, you know, there's a virus going on. We know people are sheltering in place. And we have kind of that control factor um, that allows us to really study how that's impacting our environment. So I don't know. I think it's uh, it's pretty pretty darn cool. So Joey, do you have any uh, comments? You've seen some cool stuff too, haven't you? Well, I was just actually so I was gonna send it over to Joey because I'm wondering um, what about people that don't live in the mountains? You know, I think Joey said. You know, again, I'll throw it to Joey, but um, what kind of stuff have you seen? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and throw up an image here. Um, you guys see me again? Yeah. Yes. So this was on 
our morning run the other day. So um, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool to come over a hill. I'll show you in a minute where this is in proximity to the superior uh, Broomfield area. But it was pretty cool to come over the hill. And I mean, number one, talking about what Amanda was seeing there, there's no brown haze. And if you live in the city, you're very familiar with that brown haze. You know, we get the, the silhouette of the mountains, but it's usually covered by that, that haze. And you're like, ah, it's almost picture worthy, but that haze kind of ruins it. So come over the hill and you see the, the beautiful white capped mountains. And then there's two bull elk. They're, they're both, uh, both in velvet. They're both kind of just grazing along this running path and people going the other way to give you an idea of how unfamiliar of a site that is in the city. People going the other way are like, oh, is that a moose? And I was like, nope, that's not a moose. That's an elk, a little bit a little bit different species there. So um, <laughs> it was pretty cool to see them right off the running path. And I'll show you here in a minute, kind of the proximity to where they are to everything. I will say this is a familiar view though. Yeah, I don't, pretty I don't live one. in Colorado anymore, but uh, this used to be the view from our office, if I remember. Yep. Correctly. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, um, I mean, you get elk sometimes down like um, near Golden, there's like elk crossings um, down there, there's kind of a, a corridor, but that's a little bit closer to the foothills, so a little bit more expected than this, to see them that close into uh, the highway and the hiking trails, that's, again, that's something I've, I've never seen. I okay. actually, I take that back after the, um, the 2010 fire, we actually had a bull elk in our backyard and they usually don't come down this low. And that was the one that eventually made its way all the way to Boulder. But you think about what happened to the habitat in 2010 with the fire. I mean, elk's kind of confused about what's happened. Like where, where do my food go? Um, so, you know, they make changes in accordance to where they can find food and where they're comfortable and they're comfortable here now. So where you got, Joey? So from my side, um, this, you can see this really thin trail running through there right there. And then the elk were actually right on this hillside here. And it, it looks like a, you know, kind of where that little shovel is. But if you pan out and look, Right up here on the, the north side of the screen, that's Target. And then, you know, a couple hundred yards to the east is Highway 36. And McCaslin's a pretty, pretty well-traveled road. So it's interesting to see, you know, when you pan out a little bit more, they came a good distance. You know, a lot of the, the herd that Amanda's mentioning, we see them further down south, kind of down here by Golden and these big reservoirs down there. But these guys are pretty you know, kind of northeast of where the other herd is from. But it, uh, it brings back some interesting points as to how their, how their habits are changing. And, you know, one of the big things in Colorado is uh, vehicles and wildlife collisions. So now you think of, you know, there's not having to worry about running across the road. So now they're kind of going back to their, their natural areas where they would cruise to get vegetation in the winter when it's still super snowy up top and um, kind of how that will change. Um, but yeah, so that, and then the other, the other really interesting thing I've been thinking of is um, March into April is kind of peak calving season. And if you think about March, how many of us were inside our house where we would normally be out skiing? I mean, Vale's been studying this for a while, the impacts of skiing on the, the elk calving season up there and the decline in the herd. So it'll be interesting to see when they do, you know, later this year, or next year, when they do the next population study on the elk and um, deer to kind of see if we had a, a bounce back with everybody staying inside for that month and letting them go through their their natural course and not be interrupted when they're calving and kind of in this critical phase. But it'll be really cool to see what that changes into and um, the other big change I think will be interesting as a hunter is in the anybody who hunts in Colorado knows that if you want to find an animal you're going to hike to the nastiest darkest steepest hole on the side of a mountain come this fall. So now you got these animals who are going way far east, getting out onto the plains. So it'll be really interesting to see come fall time, are they still going back up into these nasty holes or maybe they're down a little closer to the city because this is where their natural habitat is. So it'll be pretty interesting to see how that all shakes out. Yeah, I think we're just, just starting to understand what the drivers are. I mean, obviously 
um, you can make the connection between the lack of, of people. You can also say, again, you know, it was a really, we have big snowpack this year. Yeah. Um, but again, I think it has to be some sort of absence of, of, of transit. And that's one thing I still haven't had a chance to look at is like, um, I think it's Sentinel-3 that does more of the atmosphere analysis is to look at the trends over time and, and trying to correlate that. And that's really a cross-disciplinary study where you would work with like, you know, um, you know, Forest Service or National Park System and try to look at like maybe Rocky Mountain National Park and, and try to look at how, you know, atmospheric dynamics, um, less pollution have, you know, really changed the dynamics of the herds that they have tagged. Um, so I think there's some really interesting science that's going to come out of this. I think there will be um, too. Before we get on to the outreach, Abby, I did want to show um, just a quick, um, I did get some good data from Venice. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just show that real quick. Um, we've all heard about how the Venice Lagoon is um, cleared up. And um, so you may throw back to what we were talking about in that first episode. Yep. So you're able to actually, for the first time in how, however many years from satellite imagery, you can actually see the canals in Venice where they used to be murky from all the boats going in there and churning up the silt and stuff and the runoff from them. Yeah. I think maybe Amanda has some technical difficulties. That's what happens when you live in the mountains. <laughs> hey, I think the view's worth, I think the view's worth the technical difficulties. That's right. Sometimes the internet goes out. What are yep. you going to do, right? But we got a killer view out the front door. So actually, uh, while we're you know, while we are waiting through her technical difficulty. Oh, look, there she is again. Oh, wait, she's muted. There we go. Now, now you're unmuted. Try it again. Good. Okay. Good. Sorry. Right. That, that was a total Zoom crash. Like that was that was a spectacular one. I thought I was able <laughs> to get back in pretty quickly. Like a champ. Okay. Um, do do do. Sharing screen. Go to this. Um, so some of you have probably seen this image of a nice jellyfish in the Venice canals, which having been to Venice, I would have never thought to see anything living in those canals. So that's cool. Um, but here's some images that I got from Sentinel-2. Um, and on the, the left panels, I think it's Venice off there, the left panels are both 2019. So in the upper left, that's band two of Sentinel. And then in the lower left, that's a true color of um, Sentinel-2. And then on the right panels are, um, again, band two, which is the blue band, and then the true color. And the true color, you really don't see a whole lot of change. If you study it, you do start to see, um, you know, it's a little bit more reflective in the blue, which means that you've got clearer water or perhaps you're getting a sandy bottom that is um, starting to become visible. You can see really though, when you put a color table on band two, again, the blue band, that you see some really, you know, it's a lot brighter in 2020. So typically um, with, with other channels, like a near infrared channel, if I were to see it being brighter, I would say it's more turbid because that sandy, like uh, sand and um, uh, I'm losing my words here, and debris in the water uh, reflect strongly in the near infrared, but in the blue band, you're really seeing blue water re reflected. Think of like clear Caribbean blue water. Um, so I want to investigate this one a little bit more, but um, just to plug in for Sentinel Hub and Copernicus, all that data is free. Um, and there's some really nice clear images of Venice um, that you could use with NB's change detection um, pretty, pretty easily. I was working on this this morning, so I didn't have time to geocorrect some of this. Um, but the bottom line is there, there's a wealth of data that you can study even now. And this was, um, these were images taken from uh, April, um, from just a year different, roughly almost the same day. So I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So I'll go back to Zoom and stop sharing. So question for you. Um, what about data fusion being used to see the images or is, can Sentinel do it without it? Um, it would depend on the kind of data fusion. I mean, you don't really need it here. Um, you really need a before and after. Um, so the before would be 2019 and the after is 2020. You could even do it a before of being like, um, you know, February of this year and the after being April sometime. You might have some sun angle differences. 
that's what's nice to do a year apart is you roughly have the same sun angle so you have kind of the same shadowing happening and that's so you're observing real change not like just the change of the you know where the earth is relative to the sun so no you wouldn't have to necessarily do any kind of fusion and actually you know i'm wondering too you were talking about right now kind of being the prime time to you know get the images of how things are right now just for the sake of comparison later yeah. on. um anything interesting in particular that you're making sure that you get right now <laughs> I'm trying to think of some stuff I tasked recently. Joey, um, to you as well. I, you know, some of the things that I've been tasking, um, you know, I've tasked Wu with other sensors, uh, Wuhan, Tokyo. Um, I definitely tasked a number of kind of wilderness areas in the States, um, aside from Colorado, um, Mississippi Delta region. Um, on a really weird side note, I tasked Chernobyl just because it had a fire between this year and last year, and I'm kind of curious what you'd see there. Which is fascinating, um, by the way. Absolutely yeah. fascinating. So, I mean, it, I would just say if it's your area of interest, especially like, you know, NEON, um, which is the, they do long-term hyperspectral studies. Um, I need to get in touch with Dave Holslander, who will maybe do distancing at some point. Um, and see kind of what they're really changing because they pr have an out outstanding data set of these long-term ecological research sites that have been like, you know, meticulously measured for, you know, wildlife and plants. And um, they'll start probably doing their measurements for this season soon. So to look year over year with that data will be absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Joey, any places you want to look so it's, it's funny you brought up the Sentinel thing a little bit earlier. So we're actually, um, one of the team members, Jenny Bloom, is uh, getting ready to pull some information together to write a blog on the kind of the Colorado Front Range and what that has looked like atmospherically since the, the stay at home was ordered. And, you know, now we're probably going to see oh, some, cool. of the, some of the trends start to go back of um, kind of air pollution. But that was one thing that we started to, to work on was once the actual data the stay at, stay at home was executed she started pulling down some of that sentinel data so we'll have a we'll have kind of a high level overview look at that come out on the website in a few weeks hey what about um you know obviously right now for me anyway i can't keep track of it but you know different states and different portions of the country kind of like going back on rolling back some of the stay at home stuff are there certain areas that you are particularly like, okay, if you're going to get imagery, you better do it now. I'd say like New York, like, you know, Times Square, you think of how, how many, how many opportunities are you going to have it where Times Square is completely, you know, for weeks was completely abandoned. There's nobody down there taking pictures, no tourists. So I'd say more like those tourist hotspots or even Washington, DC, you know, where you I would say even like Florida beaches, like you, yeah. at this time of year, they'd usually be packed and yeah, I think they reopened them, but probably people got some images without that. And especially near the, I grew up in Pensacola, the Gulf Coast, which had BP impacts and, you know, having a chance to kind of look at the condition of the, the sand and the near shore environment um, with nobody there is kind of an interesting thought. Yeah. I mean, the city stuff's interesting to me, but. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so your potholes fixed with high res data, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, I live in a high rise in the middle of Oakland. So what can I say? I'm part yeah. of those. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and switch topics um, so we, we don't run out of time for it. Um, this is kind of a fun one. You know, I just want to shift gears and talk to you guys about something else that's going on while everyone's stuck at home. And that's the opportunity to jump on the whole virtual classroom bandwagon um, and start introducing our kids to the world of remote sensing. You know, the images that I'm seeing from our industry on social media are really cool because they're showing the way that, you know, we're educating the next generation of remote sensing and imagery scientists. And I know that both of you have had experiences with that um, in the last month. Joey, do you want to share yours? Yeah. So I will go ahead and <clears throat> share here. Well, let me know when that comes up. I see it. All right. So like most people, um, we've had our three-year-old twins home with us. And what that means is 
your work day is part of their play day. So there's been many conference calls where I have a little buddy sitting on my lap watching in with me. And in this case, we were actually um, going over Megan Gallagher, who was one of the first geospatial distancing presenters. Uh, her and I were going over using SAR for monitoring uh, rice yields in South America. And um, one of my daughters, Amelia, came over and was sitting on my lap. And she comes up and she's like, I really like the green one. That's pretty. So it's, it's fun that, you know, us as adults, knowing what SAR is, we think it's pretty and we're like, that's awesome. Like, that's really cool data. And then to have a three-year-old come over and share that same sentiment and be like, wow, that is pretty. So it'll be cool to see, you know, all these people are at home with their kids and uh, whether or not we know it, our kids are getting exposed to, to geospatial and remote sensing and seeing these images on our screen or hearing us talk. So it'll be cool to see if we get a, a new generation of little, little people interested in remote sensing and starting to explore some of these technologies like SAR when they get older. To be fair, uh, I'd say that I would have the same sensibilities when I look at imagery. <laughs> look how pretty it is. We should yeah. definitely make something with that. Yeah. Amanda? Yeah. So, um, and we may come back and do another distancing on this. You guys have probably heard me mention some of the ocean plastics work I had been doing. Um, so I decided to, um, I've got a couple of nephews and niece and uh, you know, sat down and explained we were detecting trash from space. And basically what I would do is just show them Google Earth, like show them where their house is. You know, my little nephew Owen is like, if I go outside, can you see me? And it's like, it doesn't quite work that way, buddy, but good question. Um, <laughs> so, you know, just to kind of get them acquainted with the knowledge that there's things in the sky taking pictures and then I would kind of dive in. But, you know, here's my picture of um, my little nephew, um, Towns, get to the camera. Let's not lose you again. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So um, you can see my little nephew Towns. He's looking at his house in uh, Google Earth um, in his elementary school and and just being kind of wowed by what he can see from, you know, things that, you know, kids have a really plainer view of the world. They don't really think about um, about things like looking down from the sky. But when he saw his like his house and garage, like the click that he had was just like, so he's like, that's my house. Like, I didn't even have to tell him. I just knew his address. And um, he's like, there's our garage and there's our car and there's this and there's my friend's house. And, you know, it just, it, it, hooked, it clicked in his head and it clicked in the other kid's head that I've shown this to. Um, and then once they kind of get the concept of, you know, seeing things from the sky, being able to talk to them about more science type talks, like, I mean, we explain like anomaly, like you've got, you know, 20 stars in a circle, the circle's the anomaly. Well, that's just what we're doing with imagery. It's just a little bit different. Um, so that's been really fun. And I'm working actually now with the o Ocean Voyages Institute. Um, they're the ones who've been cleaning up trash with giant uh, sailing ships. They're about to set sail for this, this year's um, collection. Um, and we're talking about putting up uh, something on YouTube along the lines explaining what their work is. So I think, this, like Joey said, it's a great opportunity to expose some kids when it's hard to get science lessons and other information to them um, at this time and to, you know, give them a little bit of something else to look at, not just, um, you know, the worksheets that they're doing. Or, you know, YouTube videos or right. all the other fun, exciting things that are just too, too uh, appealing, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, we're actually coming up on our time limit. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, next week, we're gonna be joined by Stuart Blundell. Uh, the man has some of the most infectious energy that I've ever witnessed. And I think that actually everyone else that's on this panel could attest to that as well. Yes. Um, yeah, so I have no doubt that he will entertain and delight for our May 7th episode. Um, so thank you so much, you guys. Um, I love just talking with you anyway, and so it's awesome to be able to do this. Uh, remember that you can find details about Stuart's episode for next week, uh, along with recordings from all of our previous episodes and this one at harrisgeospatial.com slash geospatial distancing. 
That's right. We got a URL, our own official <laughs> URL now. Very it's exciting. official. We are so fancy. You're getting it done. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so once again, thanks, guys. Um, and until we meet again next week, remember that eventually, when all of this goes back to normal, you are going to wish you had this much time to watch TV in your sweatpants. So let's just try to enjoy where we're at right now and maybe give yourself a break because you'll be lamenting your lack of free time before you even know it. All right. <laughs> see you guys next week. See you. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you. Bye.